Greetings, environmentalists, and welcome to Lecture 9 of Environmental Science 1301. Today, we'll be examining wastewater, uh, septic tanks, and public water systems. Let's take a look at your learning objectives and see how they correlate to what you'll be learning about today. You're going to be able to identify the differences between point source and non-point source pollution, and you'll also be able to discuss and identify different types of wastewater technologies. Some of them are kind of cool, actually. You're going to assess the purpose of wastewater pretreatment by industrial facilities and why that's required by law. We'll evaluate some septic tank technologies that are out there and identify the criteria for becoming a public water system. We'll look at the necessity for public water systems to issue an annual consumer confidence report known as a CCR. And then we'll look at the process of enforcing and lifting a boil water notice for drinking water. So let's start with the important concept of this lesson and that's understanding what waters of the United States really are. There's a definition in Title 33, Code of Federal Regulations, Part 328.1, and it states that the government controls all waters which are currently used or which were used in the past or may be susceptible to use in interstate or foreign com commerce, including all waters, which are subject to the ebb and flow of the tide are considered as water of the United States, which includes dot, 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 a whole slew of things. Let's look at a few. Wetlands, lakes, rivers, streams, ponds, playa lakes. If you don't know what a playa lake is, they're basically areas on uh, desert land that are flat. If you live in Texas, they were out by, by Lubbock, for example, and they have rainwater or groundwater that seep up in them and then they dry up. So that's what a playa lake is. But the one thing that's not clearly defined in this definition is if groundwater is regulated by the United States and owned. It's not clearly identified, but it's also not clearly uh, eliminated. And in the case of the state of Texas, it clearly is eliminated from their definition. So looking at waters of the United States, basically you have to have some kind of permit because waters of the United States are protected. So any discharge to a river, a lake, a stream, etc., must require a permit and other in order to be authorized. So wastewater treatment is no exception to the rule. This process simply expedites or speeds up nature's natural process of breaking down infiltrating uh, wastewater. So that prevents humans from having these giant cesspools like you'll see over here. So this cesspool is probably from a, a wastewater line or a septic tank that's gone bad that's come up to the surface. But imagine if we had large bathtubs or pools, literally swimming pools full of cess material that is human excretion. It would not be a pleasant place to live, nor would it be sanitary. So the United States government, EPA specifically, has rules that prohibit that. We'll be looking at important terms regarding wastewater, so let's start with the term of point source. Point source means that the water originates from a single specific source, a pipe. You can trace it back to its origin. Point source pollution is deliberately intentionally discharged and requires a permit to waters of the United States or whatever state that you may be in. Examples would be a wastewater discharge from a factory or a wastewater discharge from a plant, like a wastewater facility. That's exactly what you're seeing here is treated wastewater coming in, being discharged back into waters of the United States. What is non-point source pollution? This is water pollution that does not originate from a specific isolated source, but represents the cumulative effect of pollution from stormwater events. So it could pick up pollution from multiple different places. For example, this parking lot. Often, non-point source pollution is unintentional and is very difficult to isolate and regulate. Examples include fertilizing a lawn or driving a car or having all these parked cars in a parking lot for some kind of major store retailer and it rains and we get oils, we get dirt, we get grease, we get trash, could have dirty diapers, things of that sort. That's non-point source pollution because we can't trace exactly where it originated. 
So when you look at the two, it has to come out of a pipe for it to be point source. And even some pipes may have discharges of non-point source pollution because they're stormwater pipes. For example, this is a stormwater conveyance system, but what's happened is it's been raining in the city and all of its rainwater or stormwater is channeled in and it's pollu polluting this water here and pollu producing a plume of pollution. So we can't trace back exactly where that plume started. If we could, it would be a point source. So in wastewater, we're dealing primarily with point source. In stormwater that you had in our prior lecture, we were dealing with non-point source pollution. Industrial pretreatment. It's any improvement made or treatment made to wastewater by an industrial facility before their wastewater leaves their site and is sent to a wastewater treatment plant. The key word is before. So they do some form of improvement or treatment to help make that wastewater not so potent to when the wastewater treatment plant receives it, it doesn't kill off the bacteria that you're fixing to learn about that do the job of breaking down wastewater. So the EPA identifies specific industrial sectors, much like they do in stormwater, which are subject to very, very tailored and individualized pretreatment standards. For example, a metal finisher will have completely different standards than a, a uh, manufacturing bakery or a photographic lab that uses silver in their photographic manufacturing. So every one of those facilities is very tailored and unique to what they have to uh, test for. If a facility is subject to pretreatment standards, they must perform the following. Monitoring a specific constituents that the rules outline that their industry has to test for. Number two, report results to the State Department or Environmental Quality or the EPA, depending on where they are. So pretreatment programs, what's the purpose of them? Pretreatment program is any wastewater treatment plant that is permitted to treat 5 million gallons a day or more. So that's at the local level. So meaning like the city level who has a wastewater treatment plant, if they have a plant that's rated for 5 million gallons or more a day, they're automatically subject to pretreatment enforcement programs. In other words, they have to develop an enforcement program to regulate any of the businesses and industries that discharge into their sewer system. So this enforcement program uh, for regulated industrial facilities discharging potent wastewater to their system has to be done or else there could be a pass-through. What's a pass-through? Let's look at the picture. So you have raw sewage, and let's say it's potent sewage from some candy manufacturer because they'll have to clean out their bats and their uh, mixers and so forth, so they'll use some very uh, corrosive and other types of chemicals to do that. So that stuff's pretty pretty potent and it's going to come in the door if it was a pass-through the color and the character would be the same coming out the back end in this case we've got the right type of thing going on where pretreatment was done at the facility and the water was able to be treated at the wastewater treatment plant allowing for clean water to leave so that's the goal we don't want to pass through where the water is the same coming in and it's the same going out that's that's not good so by definition, a pass-through is any wastewater treatment plant that discharges effluent that is not treated to their permit standards. So what's a wastewater treatment plant or a WWTP? It is a facility in which the treatment of wastewater is performed. How simple is that, right? And then what's that in comparison to a publicly owned treatment works, a POTW? The POTW is stuff like this over here. It's the pipe. This includes wastewater pi pipes, their collection system, manholes, lift stations, anything that moves wastewater from businesses and homes to the actual wastewater plant itself. So there's two pieces to that because sometimes the POTW is not owned by the same entity or entities that run the wastewater plant. So most of the time, a city will own both pieces, like they'll own the publicly owned treatment works and they'll also own the actual wastewater treatment plant. But there are exceptions to the rule. So what is wastewater? Water that has been used for washing, flushing, or in a manufacturing process and contains waste products and creates sewage. What's an influent versus an effluent? This picture shows it really well. IN, the prefix, refers to coming in, and EF refers to exiting or leaving. So, influent is the raw wastewater that comes from domestic 
commercial and industrial sources that enters the wastewater treatment plant for cleaning. So this is the dirty stuff that needs to be treated, right? Once that dirty stuff has been treated, it's referred to as effluent. So wastewater that has been treated, disinfected, and is discharged from the wastewater treatment plant, plant back into the environment is considered effluent. So anytime a wastewater treatment plant discharges water, we want it to meet those standards of their permit. So the effluent quality has permit limitations for specific constituents of concern. What's INI or inflow and infiltration? This is when rainwater gets mixed with wastewater because of breaks or crack in both stormwater and wastewater pipes. So if you take a look at this pipe, can you see how there's some cracks there? And this is the sanitary sewer line. Well, we would also have a stormwater line that could do exactly the same thing. So what will happen is when it rains a bunch, the infiltration drains down to the pipe. So you get rainwater in the pipe, which causes it to overflow and mix with the wastewater. And the wastewater pops up through these cracks and through manholes and comes up to the surface. It's not a pretty picture and it is definitely a risk to human health in the environment. So let's see a little video on that for a minute. As infrastructure ages in this country, especially the original clay tile sewer systems from 100 years ago or more, infiltration and inflow becomes a problem with many communities. America's infrastructure is failing and has a, a huge uh, financial need. EPA has estimated greater than $80 billion. Underground and out of sight, sewer lines tend to be forgotten. Over time, traditional sewer systems develop cracks and deficiencies. During wet weather and high volume storm events, water enters the sanitary sewer system through leaking joints and structural defects and can quickly fill the system beyond capacity. Extraneous flow can spill onto streets and discharge into lakes and rivers creating public health risks and contaminating the environment. We're a small city of about 15,000 people and had an extensive I, &I problem. And we evaluated some different types of systems, replacing the gravity sewer system, low pressure force mains, and a step system. After evaluating the costs that were required and how intrusive we would be on the community, we chose the low pressure force main. E1's low pressure sewer system consists of a network of small diameter pressure pipes and grinder pumps installed at each residence or business. The grinder pump station collects the wastewater, grinds the solids into small particles and conveys it to a larger sewer main or directly to a wastewater treatment plant. The pressure tight system virtually eliminates extraneous flows. This has profound effects on treatment plant capacity, cost, and performance. Over the last five years, we've evaluated the cost that we've saved at the treatment plant, and it appears that we've reduced the amount of flow to the plant by about 27 million gallons per year. That turns into $70,000 per year savings. With the E1 system, I and I can typically be reduced to virtually 0% compared to traditional solutions that may achieve 30% reduction. The low pressure sewer system uses two to four inch force mains that follow the contour of the land and are installed just below the frost line, eliminating the need for large, deep trenches. These small trenches can equal huge savings. The construction savings for low pressure sewer versus gravity sewer is approximately 20% and shallow trenches mean less disruption to the community and minimal environmental impact. The low pressure force main was a great opportunity to stay away from the water table and not have to worry about the inflow and infiltration any longer. Low pressure sewer systems are gaining acceptance as a viable and cost effective alternative for both remediation and replacement of gravity collection sewers. When any of our clients are considering low pressure sewer system with individual grinder pumps, we always recommend Environment One as the pump of choice for their individual applications. The reliability of the equipment, the responsiveness of the company, and the innovator of the grinder pump technology over 40 years ago is what leads us to make that recommendation to our client. 
So in no way was I trying to support E1 systems. What I liked about that video was that it showed you what INI does, inflow and infiltration, and it gave a viable solution for the problem. Just to dig a mile of ground or a mile of ground, and we would call it virgin ground, to put pipe in, digging a trench, what they described in the video, can literally cost a quarter of a million dollars. Sometimes more if you got bedrock, like limestone or granite that you have to contend with. So it's important that you find a solution to this because this issue's a real problem. So now we're going to face and take a look at wastewater treatment processes and talk about the main ones that are out there. So in the process of treating wastewater, basically certain things happen in every wastewater treatment type that's out there. And the first step is primary treatment. By definition, that refers to any raw wastewater that enters the wastewater treatment from influent pumps. So that could come from all the houses and businesses in town and it makes it from the publicly owned treatment works to the wastewater plant. This is where we're gonna take out all the dirt, the trash, the rocks, all the personal items that people flush down in the toilet that you wouldn't want people to see. Those are removed using a bar screen just like this one. So this one's constantly moving and it scrapes off the trash and goes into a dumpster which ends up in the landfill. So the wastewater moves into the primary settling tanks after this happens, which allows additional solids to sink to the bottom of the tanks and become sludge. This is where a wastewater plant stinks the most, to be honest with you. And uh, when you go to one, uh, this is where you need to breathe through your mouth. <laughs> From that point forward, after you get to the process where oxygenation occurs, it's a lot nicer to smell. This is part of the primary treatment as well. And notice that there's no movement of the water, so it will stink. Essentially, this part of the wastewater plant is the area that has the highest odor issues because the bacteria have not yet entered an aerobic environment where oxygen is being added. When that happens, it breaks down the wastewater. And that's what this bacteria that's naturally in your bowels does. So it's pretty remarkable stuff how nature works. So basically, we're taking a giant cesspool and we're running it through a plant to speed the process up. What might take literally months and months and months to do, we can do in seven to nine hours effectively at a wastewater treatment plant. So notice at the bottom of this 17 foot deep or so vat, uh, meaning actual looking like a giant swimming pool without water there, uh, this is the area where oxygen is added and you can see these rails down here where the rails move a rake and the rake moves the gray sludge, which is this material and the stuff that accumulates at the bottom. So at this wastewater treatment plant, they're removing that sludge and uh, improving the performance of this particular basin. So what's secondary treatment? This is where you don't feel or smell the odor so bad, and here's why. The aeration basins is part of secondary treatment. So you add oxygen to this bacteria that is oxygen-loving bacteria, and great things happen. So let's see what that is. Once the primary treatment has been completed, the wastewater moves into the aeration tanks. In most wastewater treatment plants, microscopic aerobic bacteria break down the wastewater in just a few hours. That's their job, they eat it. That's all they do for a living is they eat this wastewater and, and break it down. This is one of the most important stages of wastewater treatment because a stable environment must be maintained for the aerobic bacteria to perform its job. If it's not, they die and then you get a pass through like we mentioned earlier. So we don't want that to happen. So the third stage of treatment is called tertiary treatment. An example of this would be clarifiers. This is a clarifier. It looks like a big round pool. And this is a stage of treatment that occurs after the secondary phase is complete and represents cleaned wastewater, which is filtered again to remove more solids and finally disinfected with chlorine or another disinfection technique so it can be discharged back to waters of the United States. When you see an aerial view of 
clarifiers. Most big wastewater treatment plants like this one have multiple clarifiers. This one's out of use right now, but these are in use and the idea is that the water gets cleaner within a few hours of staying in that clarifier. It's just one more stage of removing solids. So treatment typically includes the use of the clarifiers to help move solids and cleans the water. Another form of tertiary treatment that also happens at this particular plant are sand filters. And many wastewater plants have some form of sand filtration because sand by nature is a really good uh, groundwater cleaner. So it can be a good wastewater cleaner too. This treatment may include sand filters that assist in removing additional solids from the improved wastewater that's gone through the secondary and, and uh, primary treatment. Another form of tertiary treatment is disinfection, and this is a chlorination basin right here, and it looks like a little maze, and what happens is the water travels through each of these little things, kind of goes through it, and it's there for about 20 minutes minimum, because the rules require that there's a minimum contact period that must be met in order for disinfection to be uh, successful. So treatment is required to include some form of disinfection, such as chlorine, ozone, or another method of killing microbial life. So one of the things the wastewater treatment plant has to do is test their effluent for microscopic and microbial stuff. Another thing you might see at certain wastewater plants are anaerobic bacteria digesters. And that's what these blue lids are. They're actually big giant uh, holding tanks for really potent wastewater, like from a blood-infested, saturated wastewater from a slaughtering plant. Well, you can't run that through traditional treatment like I just showed you with the bacteria or else it'll kill it. It's just too potent for it to do its job. So it needs some cleaning first. And there's another type of bacteria that are super hardy, and they love this really rich, potent stuff. So they're called anaerobic bacteria. So these wastewater treatment plants may use anaerobic digesters for potent wastewater, such as slaughtering plant blood waste or food production waste. Wastewater typically remains in these large containers for about 30 to 40 days at a set temperature, and the bacteria breaks down the potent wastewater. The anaerobic digestion process creates methane uh, gas and the wastewater treatment plant, plant can flare the gas or reclaim it for energy known as RNG. Here's an example of flaring. So basically the wastewater treatment plant has no mechanism for reclaiming that energy or already has reclaimed enough and this is the excess that they have. And that's the case in the latter uh, or in this particular wastewater treatment plant's case. They do use the energy and uh, harvest it to run their plant, but they had excess stuff that they needed to burn off because you can't just release methane to the environment, to the air. It's illegal. So if you ever see burning flares like this in any capacity, there's a reason for it, and it's because the law requires that the methane be burned off. So the wastewater treatment plant generates more methane gas than they can utilize for energy reclamation as renewable natural gas, RNG. The flares are used to burn off the excess gas. You'll see this at landfills. You'll see this at uh, gas production facilities, natural gas, and so forth. So I wanted you to realize that this is actually not a bad thing. It's to improve the amount of heat capacity being sent up into the atmosphere, which affects climate. Methane holds substantially more heat than carbon dioxide. All right, at some place in the wastewater treatment plant, you'll have a discharge point where effluent, that's the treated stuff, right? leaves the site. So every wastewater treatment plant has a discharge point, which is the site where treated effluent leaves their facility and heads downstream. Treated wastewater is used by downstream cities for a drinking water supply or source. Your water may also have been previously treated wastewater. Isn't that a yummy thought to think about? That's why you want them to do their job. Obviously, it would be treated to a drinking water standard before you'd be taking a sip of it. But nevertheless, this is the discharge point right here. Since we had stormwater earlier I, uh, in our prior lesson, this is the best management practice, and it's riprap in the form of granite rock that's there to anchor this bank in place. So here's your chlorination basin, and here's your discharge location into a major river. 
So what are the types of wastewater treatment technology that's out there? Let's take a look. An MHOF system is the first type, and this system functions much like a massive septic tank for multiple houses. It's a raw wastewater, enters through the center, and solids undergo anaerobic digestion in the lower chamber. So it's like two levels in height. After a while, the remaining fluids release into a leaching field or, or land applied. So it works much like a just like a septic system actually. But an Imhoff system is very practical for very small communities and it does get chlorinated. So just know that there'll be a point of contact somewhere where that happens uh, or it has residual time to break down in the Imhoff. You're not gonna see many of these. They're very uh, antiquated, but there's still some out there. A lagoon pond system would be appropriate for a small city. Uh, usually with several hundred residents and or less. You're not going to find it for much bigger than that. And here's why. This system uses large multiple aeration basins to biodegrade the various solids in wastewater. The biological solids release carbon dioxide or CO2, which is utilized during photosynthesis. So the treatment process requires a long retention period in each pond of about 30 days and every series of ponds. So let's say you have two or three ponds. In this case, we've got two ponds right here, one here, one here, and another big pond right here. So there would be 30 days in each one. So understand that once it leaves the last pond, it'll go into an infrastructure called a weir, and that's just a concrete structure that allows the treated effluent to go over and then it's disinfected and returned back to the environment. So one thing you have to have for this is a lot of land space and you don't require a very high level of operator license to run it. So it's very effective for small filtration needs such as a small, small town. But this would not work for a big city for example, like a Houston, a Chicago, a Los Angeles, a New York, it's just not practical because it can't treat fast enough the wastewater that's generated by a high volume of population. A more advanced system is called reverse osmosis. And this is also used in drinking water technology, but this process works exactly as in the reverse osmosis desalinization process, but it is very expensive and it does can only treat a certain amount of wastewater water per day. So it's not a really good fit for large cities. Medium-sized cities of a thousand people or so might work really well. It does require a higher operator license and more experience to operate, and you can look at a system and see why. There's a lot more moving parts, it's more complex, and it requires more maintenance. So let's look at how it works. Pressure pushes the wastewater through a semi-permeable membrane. Think of it like a, a giant um, contact lens. And it filters everything larger than the size of a water compound. So on one side of the contact membrane is all the icky stuff that we don't want to keep on going through. And then on the other side, the clean water passes through. This system really is a good fit for medium-sized communities of several thousand people. The activated sludge plant is the most common of all plants out there. And this wastewater treatment process was discussed earlier as I walked you through a wastewater treatment plant involving oxygenation of bacteria. So let's look at the classic activated sludge and then tell you why it's really called activated sludge. The goal of the system is to keep some of the bacteria alive. And this is what your bacteria actually looks like. So you want to keep some of it alive and it not to die. And it has a very short life cycle, not very, but just a few days, right? And so the idea is to make new bacteria and keep that process ongoing so nature does its thing. And it's a fine balance between chemistry and temperature and a food resource. So you have to imagine these bacteria are like living at Thanksgiving meal all the time, trying to eat, 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 eat. So the plant superintendent must be an expert in recognizing the precise chemical and biological balance of an environment for the bacteria as shown on the right. So these little guys, they're being pampered to do their job. And we want them in this aerator tank to 
reproduce so we can keep some always coming in through the raw water and keep some alive on this end and then as they come in to the clarifier they'll die off and then they'll sink to the bottom and they'll become sludge. So I think this is a good place to take a break at septic tanks. We'll come back and start uh, with septic tanks and talk about how they work and then move into public water systems. So I'll see you back in a few minutes. Bye.